Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. My name is Jim Riley. I'm glad to see you all here. Our topic tonight is the preservation of antique radio collections. And the purview of this is uh, obviously antique radios and associated vintage electronics equipment, including televisions, vintage scientific equipment, and so on. So uh, we're going to begin our, um, our talk tonight with a kind of a Rorschach test. So you ready? We're going to see if you're the right audience for this presentation. OK. Got it? Got the test? If you're, here's, here's how to interpret. If your eye went to the radio first, and your eye did not go to Marilyn Monroe putting on makeup in the chair, then you're the right audience for this presentation. So uh, regardless of whether you picked up on the radio first, or you said to yourself, hmm, that's Marilyn Monroe, we'll, we'll, we'll let you both, all of you, continue with the talk. So here's a little bit about me. Um, I am a recent AWA member, um, but I've really enjoyed my association with AWA so far. And I certainly don't claim any radio expertise, um, maybe a little uh, what I've picked up, but uh, I do claim a lot of expertise in preservation. As you heard, I directed a research lab. I did a lot of uh, laboratory research on how things deteriorate. And I consulted with a lot of institutions on uh, the practice of preservation. And the lab at RIT was focused initially on the preservation of cinema and uh, photographs and movie film and all, all of the imaging technology. But we later expanded into broad-based preservation and research. And the latter part of our work was all with the, how storage environments affect uh, materials in libraries and archives and museums. And there's the book, the, one of the books I wrote uh, was published by Kodak in 1986. And it, I'm happy to say it's uh, had a long life. It's become a kind of basic text in the field. And uh, just give you a little bit about myself. So uh, the first place to start is to talk about what preservation is and contrast it with what restoration commonly is. Preservation is all about with objects, take them as they are and prevent or forestall any further deterioration. It's all about prevention, preventing decay. And so people sometimes think, well, preservation really means getting it back into shape uh, or improving its appearance or restoring its function. That is restoration. And that is not what we're talking about tonight. Although I certainly uh, am fully aware that with collections of antique radios and, and related materials, um, there's a big emphasis on restoring the original function. Um, and that's, I'm happy to learn about that and I have. And I took the uh, AWA class, uh, Learn It, Build It, Fix It, uh, that dealt with uh, all American five radios. And there you see my attempt to uh, restore the function of an all American five. I worked on a 1942 Philco and added with help modern capacitors, as you see, and got it working again. And that was a really good experience for me. But that's just an example of restoration, which is not what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about tonight here is preservation, preventing decay, keeping things in the shape they're in for as long as possible and uh, forestalling their deterioration. This is a subject and that has uh, some fundamentals, some rules of the road. And uh, they apply to just about any kind of collection of objects as we'll see as we go along. And here are the fundamental ideas behind preservation. First of all, there's a roof overhead. You got stuff, you wanna put it in a place where rain's not gonna leak on it and it's not exposed to the outdoor weather. And uh, if this was your collection of uh, recent uh, vintage uh, CRT televisions, uh, my first advice to you would be uh, put a roof over it, get it out of the, get it out of the uh, open air. Second fundamental thing about preservation, the second 101 approach is to put a lock on the door. Security is fundamental to caring for a collection. 
And it may be simple, put a lock on the door. It may be more elaborate. It may be, you know, identifying who has access and why and, and so on. But all the fundamental ideas that roll out of security are basic to preserving any collection of any kind of objects. The third fundamental to bear in mind is that preservation depends on having some organization to a collection. You need to know what's in it and you need to know where it is. So organization and inventory uh, go hand in hand. And it might be very simple, it might be arrangements on a shelf, uh, or it might be more elaborate with um, very large quantities of material and a nice database to tell you what's there and when and facilitate research, but some kind of organization, be it humble or grand is always critical. Another fundamental is how you handle, how you treat your stuff, um, who gets to handle it, how careful are they? Are they abusive or are they very gentle? Are they moving stuff around willy nilly? It turns out that in all kinds of collections that there's a great deal of handling damage that goes on. And I can tell you that it happens in the finest of institutions, that things are damaged by improper handling. And handling is a subject that, sure, there's a common sense uh, uh, co content to it. You're careful you, and so on. But there's also kind of a professional level of, of knowledge of handling that you will see in museums uh, where um, the, the attitudes are learned and, and they're, they're sometimes exceeding common sense, how two people need to handle objects and when, when an object is, is going to bow or bend when you pick it up, et cetera. You can go on a long way with that, but awareness of handling, it's a fundamental. And the fundamental of fundamentals is, and you'll hear me say more about this, the fundamental of fundamentals is caring about the collection. That maybe seems silly and, and obvious to say, but whether it's a personal collection or an institutional collection, if nobody cares about it, if you don't have an attitude of stewardship, like I, I, I want this stuff to be preserved, I can tell you it will not be preserved. Okay, so let's dive into the meat of preservation of radio collections and start talking in specifics about electronics and radio collections. And the way that the subject is approached by people who are, who are involved in doing it is to first consider the physical materials that are here. What do you got? And what do you got answered in the form of what is it made of and how is it put together? So you know what kinds of things are in antique radio collections, uh, all of you, I'm sure. Um, there's a lot of wood in, in, in these kinds of collections as cabinetry and sometimes as structure and fundamental uh, holding things together. And wood and wood veneers, adhesives that are used in, in furniture construction, these things are a lot like furniture in many ways. So we need to know about wood and what goes wrong or right with wood and what we need to do to care for wood properly. Obviously, also, there's a lot of metals. All of the industrial metals that were part of the 19th and 20th century uh, are represented in these kinds of objects, iron, steel, aluminum, copper, and so on. Uh, and we'll talk about preservation of metals as material. A third big class of materials we see are polymers, plastics. And we'll break that down and talk about the different kinds of, of plastics, principal families of plastics, and what goes wrong with them, and what we can do about it. But it goes beyond that. There's also fabrics. There are grills and radios. There's fabrics in insulation of wires. There's uh, fabrics in other unlikely places. And we will take a a few seconds to think about what goes wrong with fabrics. They can certainly degrade and become uh, very fragile. They can be stained and tear and all kinds of things. And finally, there's glass. We know that there's lots of glass. Sometimes it's uh, built into the structural mechanisms. Most often it's, we find it in, in uh, dial glasses and lens type things but also in tubes. 
and in tubes, in the case of tubes, they're a, a construct with glass and other things like Bakelite plastics. The glass in tubes is uh, soda lime glass for the envelopes. Sometimes leaded glass or borosilica glass is used. And all glass is not alike. Soda lime glass can chemically degrade. Uh, and if you don't believe me, just ask any bottle collector and they'll, they'll, you'll get an earful about how glass can degrade and what, what goes wrong with glass. So these are the materials we're gonna find. And so what goes wrong with them? Well, it's a kind of nature versus nurture thing where some of the materials are very inherently unstable or relatively unstable or pretty stable. Um, and some of these forms of deterioration that, that are more or less une inevitable at quote unquote normal room conditions uh, are, are very much worth paying attention to. Uh, preservation really un means what do you got and what can go wrong with it? And what do you do to slow it down or prevent it? And I can tell you, and you, you know this from your own experience, as you look at radio collections, that uh, yes, things have gone wrong already. And some things, some objects are in really good shape and some are not. But, you know, a lot of them are not starting at their current age with decades and decades of age from a brand new start. Uh, they're not starting from pristine original condition. So we, we are really interested in not pushing them along the road of deterioration that's that's going to happen to them some point. We want to slow it down and maybe keep it from happening altogether. So let's go through the materials a bit. Uh, let's start with wood and wood veneers. And I mentioned that a lot of antique radio collections contain things that are made of wood or covered in wood. Wood's part of part of them such that they're really like furniture. And like furniture that we find, they're glued together. They are put together with uh, better or worse or indifferent joinery and cabinet design. And they're covered with veneers. Like these veneers on this uh, radio, you can see what's happened to it. It's split, it's peeling, it's cracked. And likewise, the finish, the varnish finishes and other kinds of finishes, um, they have cracked as well. And sometimes you see the whole structure of the radio come apart, the joinery part. And um, so what, what can we think about that from a preservation point of view? Wood, uh, wood's behavior and anyone that's worked with wood or uh, understands this clearly, wood's behavior depends on its moisture content. Wood will expand and contract uh, with different levels of internal moisture. And in a humid room, a room with high relative humidity, wood will absorb water and all of its components will, uh, all the wooden components will expand. Now veneers are on the outer edge of these objects and they feel the environmental changes first. So what you see in the lower picture here is this veneer was probably, the radio was in a damp condition. You can probably guess that from looking at it. And then it, it was allowed to dry out. What happens is the veneer dries out fast and first and shrinks, but it's still adhered to the rest of the radio. So it creates stresses that are relieved when the veneer curls, when the veneer cracks, and when the finish also uh, does a similar thing. So all the critical parts where the where uh, wood is wood is joined together across grains and so on they're going to react by changing their size and their shape as a result of the amount of water that's contained in wood. I mean, basically as a chemical matter, wood is very stable. There's certainly centuries old wood that's doing just fine. And you all have seen beautiful examples of wooden radios that are doing just fine, but some are not as we just saw. And so what do you do about this? What's the remedy? What's the preservation move for wood uh, objects? The answer, and you're going to hear from me that it's the answer for so much of our collections, the answer is to avoid the extremes of very low and very high relative humidity. Relative humidity is the environmental variable that 
determines how much water will be absorbed into water absorbent things like wood or paper or fabric or many plastics. They'll all take on or lose water and it will, won't happen instantly, but eventually they will absorb a lot of water or a little water depending on whether they're in a high RH environment or a low RH environment. And to get a little geeky here for a minute, this is, I promise, is the only graph I'm going to show, but it really makes it a very important point about environmental uh, conditions for all these water absorbent materials. And so much of it is found in, in radio collections. And what you see here is on the x axis or horizontal axis of the graph is, you can think of it as room relative humidity. And then on the y-axis, the vertical axis, it says EMC percent. What is that? That means equilibrium moisture content by percentage. So that means the percent by weight of, the, of wood when it has been allowed to come to equilibrium with an environment uh, at the relative humidities shown on the x-axis. So what do you see? Well, the way to think about this, you see it at the at the lower left corner, that's the low relative humidity end and the low moisture content end. So in that part of the of the graph, like zero to thirty percent RH, the wood has has relatively little moisture content. It's it's a little more brittle than it would be otherwise. If you bend it, it'll crack, and it it's. It's, it's shrunken, it's smaller than it will become at higher relative humidity. Then you look in the middle of the graph and you see between like 30 and 65, 70%. Here's the deal, that's, that's a, a relatively flat part of the curve. In those middle humidities, not too low, not too high, the, there's a big span of humidity where not too much moisture content change and not too much dimensional change will occur. So that, that kind of flat spot in that S-shaped S curve is, is right in the middle, and that's where you wanna keep your, your collections. 30 to 60% relative humidity, that is the sweet spot. And then where everything kind of really falls apart, both literally and figuratively, is as you go higher. And look what happens to the moisture content as you get past 80% uh, RH and up to 90% RH and even up to saturation at 100%. Suddenly the wood might contain 18, 19% moisture by weight. And in that case, it would be very swollen. It would be more flexible because that's why they bend wood with steam and heat, but it will, it will be very enlarged and it'll be creating stresses within the object. So where you wanna be is that flat spot in the middle. Okay, let's talk about metals in these collections. Many, like I said, of the common industrial metals are found here, uh, copper, iron, steel, uh, aluminum, and others. And they're all, all the common metals that were used in the industry are subject to metal corrosion but they're not all the same. Certainly we know that iron and steel are on the end of the easily corroded metals and they form rust. Um, copper is a little better and aluminum is better still and, and so on. But uh, with copper, as you see in the lower photograph here, it gets corrosion products that can affect the functionality uh, as well as the appearance of uh, of radio materials, radio objects. So metal corrosion is certainly to be avoided and looked out for. And here's the, the, uh, here's the reality of metal corrosion. Metal corrosion is a chemical process. And there are, three there are three actors involved in the drama. The metal itself, whatever it's made of and its nature, its tendency to rust, oxygen from the air, and the third one is moisture, water molecules. So if there is very little moisture present, i.e. if the relative humidity is 60% or below, and especially below 50, metal corrosion just is not going to take place 
because a key reactant in the whole thing is missing, namely the moisture. So all you gotta do to keep any of these bad metal corrosion reactions from happening is not allow your collection to be stored in damp conditions. And uh, there's not only aluminum, but you see here in this German World War II era radio, this uh, square piece of, of uh, milled and machined metal box here that's got this funny white fuzz on it. And what is that? And what, what's going on there? It's not aluminum. There is aluminum present in the tube shields in the background. But this is what's called by various names, but it's, it's sometimes called pot metal. It's, it's one of a whole variety of zinc alloys that are low melting point, easy to machine, and uh, cheap. Uh, those are very desirable uh, quantities. And, uh, you know, they're usually put together from whatever's at hand with a certain amount of zinc. But uh, they are prone to form uh, corrosion products. And that's what you see. It's not mold. It's not dust. That are, are zinc compounds, zinc carbonates and so on, that appear on the, uh, on the outer uh, box here. So all forms of metal corrosion. Well, I said, we find a lot of polymers or plastics in antique radio collections. And uh, on the left, you see uh, the plug from my 1942 Philco uh, radio that I, that I used uh, in my class at the Antique Wireless Museum uh, with uh, Dave Minkella, a wonderful teacher uh, on all American five radio uh, repair. So what's going on here with this plug is it's made of a, of a natural polymer. It's hard rubber. It's latex from trees that's been vulcanized with sulfur so that it becomes hard and moldable in a mold. So they molded this plug. It was originally uh, somewhat flexible and, uh, and not cracked and brittle and crumbly. But over time, atmospheric oxidants like ozone and nitrogen oxides, they're, they're very harmful to natural rubber. You can look at your rubber band collection if you want to verify this fact. And uh, that's what's going on there. And then other kinds of polymers are relatively more stable, like the, these Bakelite knobs you see on the right. That's not mold growing on them. I believe that that's uh, something called plasticizer. Those are chemicals that were added to the resin before it was molded to improve one thing or another, typically fire retardancy or mold, mold release come out of the mold cleanly or to improve the flexibility perhaps of the parts. So polymers can be chemically unstable. That's uh, the deal. Probably the most important uh, polymeric material we find in antique radio collections is the phenolic family. And that includes three very uh, well-known trade names, Bakelite. And uh, this radio here is an example of Bakelite, uh, thermoset molded radio case. Wonderful things, Bakelite. Bakelite's great stuff. And it's, it's cousins in the phenolic family, Plascon and Catalan are, are, are slightly different and uh, have different behaviors. But uh, actually, uh, there's a lot of great uh, materials that made out of objects made out of uh, Bakelite that are still doing rather well. Unfortunately, as its nature, when they mold phenolic plastic, and it's called a thermoset, meaning it's molded under heat and pressure, and then it never can be melted and remolded again, because the, the, the material crosslinks or hardens under the effect of heat and the pressure. And, and those crosslinks are very, they're holding the material together very tightly. And that leads to basically brittleness. It makes the material strong, but brittle and fragile and leads to the common things we see with Bakelite radios, which are uh, brittleness uh, and chipping and cracking. Like you see this little crack here in this red radio. Uh, typically uh, phenolic plastics uh, of the Blake Bakelite variety were loaded with um, deep pigments, blacks, browns, and reds. And uh, they're, they're pretty light stable. 
or as sometimes the Catalan radios, another type of phenolic, uh, wasn't as opaque and had the potential for more damage from light. But bake, bake light, we don't need to worry about that so much. But the other aspect of the nature of, of Bakelite is it's uh, prone to uh, surface abrasions. Well, that's the end of the kind of the good news on polymers in, in these kinds of collections. Uh, the unstable ones are all based on cellulose. Um, cellulosic plastics that are, that are chemically modified cellulose, typically they start with cotton linters, they treat it with acids and other uh, nitric and sulfuric acids in some in different cases, acetic acid. And, and what they end up with is a cellulose backbone that's still the long chain cellulose polymers of cotton, but it has nitro groups or acetyl groups grafted onto it. Nitro groups in the case of cellulose nitrate, also commonly called celluloid, and acetyl groups or acetic acid like vinegar in the case of cellulose acetate. And um, these things degrade under the influence of heat and moisture and over time. And actually the more unstable, believe it or not, plastic is cellulose acetate. And it's familiar in radio collections because it went under the trade name of Tenite, which was actually Eastman Chemical Company's trade name for cellulose acetate. And what happens here, and it, with nitrate and acetate both, they tend to shrink. They shrink because those groups that are grafted onto the cellulose backbone come off and they make a very acidic environment and it begins to smell like vinegar in the case of cellulose acetate plastic. Nitrate has a sort of honey sweet smell when it degrades. And the shrinkage you can see in, in, in this example on the right, because this is a, probably a cellulose uh, nitrate uh, little escutcheon or backplate for a volume control. And notice how it's uh, pulled away from the screw in the upper right. That's because it shrank and uh, the screw wasn't going anywhere. And the, the plastic just, just cracked to accommodate that shrinkage. Also, these plastics warp, they discolor and yellow. And, and cellulose nitrate is especially prone to yellowing and you see it in a bunch of uh, plastic lenses over uh, tuning dials. Uh, very, very often, they're uh, if they're not wavy and and, and cracked, they are um, yellowed at least. So, what we have to thank for that is the uh, instability of these cellulosic plastics. Believe me, I in in the photographic world, we're so much millions and millions and millions of tons of cellulosic plastics were used as photographic film. And uh, it's often degrading everywhere you find it. Well, another thing, last kind of material consideration or, or agency of destruction we need to be aware of is biodeterioration, a deterioration caused by living things. And certainly molds and mildew are living organisms. They don't have the ability to have chlorophyll and make their own food. So they tend to gather their, gain their energy and food from uh, digesting, exuding enzymes that digest and cause stains on any kind of organic object. And uh, they, like, they like wood, they like uh, gelatin, they like plastics, they like uh, cloth, but they, uh, they will grow if you give them a chance on almost any surface, including metals, because there's a biofilm that settles onto metals exposed to the open air. And just those few uh, organic materials that settle from the biofilm, uh, if you study the air, you find that it's full of all kinds of living things, mold spores and bacteria and all that, that settles down on surfaces and mold says, oh, I, I'll grow here if you give me half a chance. And that half a chance is the moisture that it requires because it can't do the chemical reactions of digesting whatever it's trying to digest and grow on if it doesn't have moisture. So once again, the culprit is high relative humidity, AKA damp conditions. And, and the environmental temperature and humidity conditions affect how insects behave as well. Some conditions are uh, 
difficult for insects, they need water too. And then maybe not so dependent on environmental conditions, but we, we need to be aware of in preservation is uh, rodents. They like to chew things, they like to make nests, and we're all familiar with what that's like. So kind of summing up this whole part, uh, it's all about whether you can deny the deterioration processes that are set up to happen, deny them the conditions that will drive them forward more rapidly than they would otherwise need to go. And I'm talking about temp improper temperature and relative humidity. These forms of deterioration are chemical reactions. And if you took high school chemistry, the teacher told you, and maybe it was on the final exam, what are the things that control the rate of chemical reactions? And the answer was uh, heat, temperature, and pressure, and concentration of reactants. So as if you've been hearing what I've been saying, uh, your, your hot, humid environment is uh, just where you don't want to be because you're supplying the reactant in the form of moisture and you're supplying the temperature. And you know the other correct answer to the exam question, by the way, was catalysis or presence of a catalyst. But we don't need that for the stuff to decay. So the worst, the worst condition of all is hot and humid. And you just want to stay away from the extremes. And I thought I would be a little more practical and say, all the places you want to keep your collection, but you sure shouldn't. The worst is outdoors. Hey, you don't want your stuff to look like this. Uh, I don't know whose idea it was to uh, put this speaker out in the desert, but uh, it certainly has lost a little bit in appearance and functionality, I would say. So where you want to put, you want stuff, stuff in the barn, you want to put it in the shed, and those barns and sheds are basically open to the outdoor conditions. And the outdoor environment has greatly changing extremes of temperature and humidity. So you don't want your stuff exposed to it. And if you keep them in an attic, and that attic is uninsulated, certainly it's going to uh, track what goes on outside. And again, not be a satisfactory space. Uh, but sinking lower, both physically and, and uh, kind of metaphorically here, it's even worse. The attic might be one thing, but it's even worse in the basement. Now, if you live like we, I, we live around here in Western New York in, in, in homes that often have basements, we're tempted to keep a collection in the basement. Well, you can if you modify the environment there, but by default, the environment in basements is damp. It automatically kind of provides the high relative humidity you don't want. And how does it do that? Well, moisture, uh, there's a lovely phrase that the British use to describe this. They call it rising damp. It means the moisture that seeps into your basement through the walls and floor and rises up from uh, from that cause. And if if your basement it, it happens to be near a water source or you you know, and the, when there's a rainstorm, water liquid water actually trickles through your basement. That's a real real no no, real red flag. But the other reason why basements are so humid and damp is because they're cooler. The air that's up in your living room at 70 Fahrenheit, maybe 60% RH, you take it into your basement where it's 55 Fahrenheit and the RH suddenly goes to 80%. That same air cooled down has a higher relative humidity. And so, and you don't want to store your stuff anywhere where direct sunlight or excessive particulates and dust or smoke, uh, smoke uh, are present. So these are things you really, really want to avoid if you care about the collections. And finally, uh, going back to the preservation fundamentals, part of handling and also part of environment is enclosures. Now with the kinds of collections that I'm talking about here, electronics collections, vintage electronics, Enclosures are, it's a difficulty, let's be honest. There's good things about enclosures. They tend to protect against light and dust. They can facilitate, they can be a good place to label an inventory without putting things stuck to the objects themselves. 
but let's face it, there's a downside too. Uh, nobody especially wants to admire what lovely boxes you have. Uh, this is very closely analogous to putting things in boxes just doesn't seem right on one level because you can't see them, you can't enjoy them. And it's hard to, to look at them and compare them when they're in a box and all the boxes look the same. In the rare book world, it's a huge fight between rare book curators and uh, conservators about boxing rare volumes. To the, to the preservationist, to the conservator, it's a no-brainer, totally. Put that book from 1500 into a box, for goodness sake. You don't want it exposed to light. You don't want it uh, seeing the, the changes of environment in your room. And uh, the enclosure is gonna help prevent that stuff, but then you won't enjoy it. So the curator wants to see it and use it and research it. And the, and the preservationist wants to put it in a box. So I don't have the answer. You got to work on it on a case by case bandit, uh, basis. But you know, you can also move things around and handle them more safely in an enclosure. And uh, they do, in, in certain instances, buffer the extremes of the environment they, with respect to relative humidity. Enclosures do not buffer temperature. The whole room, the air in the room, every object in the room, every object in every box in the room is feeling temperature change within an hour or two of when it happens. It's very quickly, uh, very quickly occurs. Humidity is a different story. The enclosure can play a role in humidity buffering. The best, the best type of enclosure for that is plastic, which is a very effective buffer or slowdown of humidity but uh, it also will trap humidity. So you don't want it sealed. It's, it's a very difficult subject, but I think enclosures certainly have their role and they might have prevented the right kind of box, but you've got to be clever. And, and to make a box for this object you see on the right, whatever it is, a speaker or whatever it happens to be, uh, an early speaker, it's beat up and obviously suffered, but it would have been a real challenge to make a proper enclosure for that object. So you got to kind of play it, play it by ear. Well, let's shift gears a little and talk about how collections can do preservation well from other points of view. You do preservation well with a collection when you understand why you have a collection. What's its purpose? You got to be clear for it. I like radios. Okay. Uh, what, what, is your purpose in assembling collections of radio under your control. And, and that purpose can be very individual depending on the context. But to do preservation, you gotta be clear. And to do preservation well, you have to understand the kinds of things we've been talking about. What are they made of? What are their physical needs? And then you have to set priorities. Uh, you have to prioritize based on the, the purpose and mission you have set for the collection yourself. You don't wanna shoot yourself in the foot by not prioritizing, say, the limited resources that you have. Not everything can or should have the highest level of preservation care. And if you think about it, and particularly this begins to apply in larger collections or as institutions like the Antique Wireless Museum and others like it, um, it's it's very good idea to develop policies to say this is our standard of care. We expect that the the objects we care for will have at least this. We and there may be a range of, of care standards, but we need to do we need to think about them and rationalize them and put them together. And let me say while we're talking on this subject that let's take a second to look at the perspectives that a private collector has, many, many of the folks that I'm talking to tonight or will be talking to on YouTube perhaps, um, are, are collectors that, are, that have personal collections. And they're put together solely out of the uh, interests and desire and resources of, of, of an individual. And then there's the perspective of institutions, institutions like museums and universities 
And they're a very different kettle of fish indeed, because institutions, uh, although in practice, a lot of them are operated out of the whims of, a, of one or two people, institutions to do the job that they're supposed to do, they need a clear mission. They need a purpose and they need to know what they're about. Why do we have these things? Why do we have these objects? Uh, and what are they for? And, and typical institutional missions and justifications for an institution to collect stuff like this is to say it's for research, or on the other hand, it's for education. It fits into a, 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 the objects got to earn their keep. They've got to fit into a uh, into a program that uh, it represents the the holistic uh, operation of the institution itself. Um, hey, um, the personal collection, as I said, um, is all about what the what what the collector wants. And by the way, if you know anything about museums, you know that museums are all collections of collections. We're talking about the Louvre, or we're talking about the museum of the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. It's all, a, somebody put those things together and it may be more than one collection and typically is. But if you have a personal collection, you need to think about what happens to it when you, its creator, its designer, you're the, you're the creative force, and that's great. You're the motivation, you're the resources. What happens when you lose interest or you die? You need to think about that because at that moment, and, I, and I've seen this so many times in my professional life, at the moment when the creator dies or the creator loses interest or is otherwise not able to um, participate any longer, that's the moment where the collection's health and life is most acutely at risk, because that's when the whole thing can, can go down the tubes. Um, it's very typical, those people who work in museums and archives and libraries, they all have a million stories of important parts of their collection were acquired when they got a call from someone who said, if you don't get over here in a week and get this stuff, it's going into a dumpster. And, and that's, that's the moment. And you wanna anticipate that that moment might happen to your personal collection and begin to think about it. And as you do think about it, your first impulse is to say, well, I'll, I'll give it to somebody. I'll give it to an institution, a university, a, a museum, a, the local historical society, a library. That's a good impulse, but there's a lot to be considered in that uh, impulse as well. As I said, institutional collections, for example, the AWA Museum is a very good example, are built from personal collections. But all institutions have their own separate mission and purpose. And this is a kind of an important point. The personal collection faces inward to the desires of the collector, but the institutional collection faces outward in society. It answers to authorities, authorities like state authorities or national authorities or parent organizations. If it's an institution in a university, it answers to the university's board of trustees. And part of facing outward is institutions have an audience and they have responsibilities to their audience, which are defined in their mission statements. So they're not all about what one person wants. They're all about what society and what the trustees and the responsible parties of that institution think it's about. So, and we know from the nature of physical collections, whatever they are, the physical collections, like a lot of radios, just to pick one example, their role in an institution's life must be very carefully defined because uh, they can't be collected and disposed of willy nilly. There need to be policies for why you have them at all. Policies that govern acquisition. What do we collect? What do we not collect as an institution? And what do we show? What do we not show? Why? Who's our audience? And that, and that sort of thing. So let me kind of end up here with a, a few 
reflections and examples on this business of giving your stuff to an institution. And, and uh, let me start with, uh, I'm gonna show you two extreme examples about how museums or collections uh, were created and how they uh, did or, or did not reflect the, the desires of their original uh, creators. And some of you may have heard of or even been to the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. It's a wonderful place to visit, fabulous. And it's a, one of the great cultural gems of Texas. It was put together by uh, a man named, his name was Kay Kimball and his wife Velma. And they, he, was, he owned 70 corporations and was one of the richest men in Texas. And he made his money and lots of money. And he and his wife Velma got personally interested in collecting art and they collected masterpieces. They did not want anything that wasn't an acknowledged masterpiece, old master paintings or masterpieces of sculpture. And when they died in the 1960s, they gave their considerable fortune to a foundation that was supposed to create the Kimball Art Museum. And um, so they hired uh, a very famous architect, Louis Kahn, to design this iconic building and to house the collection and, and make it open and available to the public. And here's their mission statement, dedicated to the education, increased enjoyment and cultural enrichment of the public through display and interpretation of works of art. And they kept their insistence that we only do masterpieces. So, and they created this wonderful museum. And if we think back to what I showed earlier, Preservation 101 and the fundamentals of preservation, we can see how they seem to have met most of those fundamental, uh, fundamental requirements here. Roof overhead, check. It doesn't have to be by Louis Kahn. It doesn't have to be an icon, but it's pretty cool they got a roof. Lock on the door, mm, you bet. They got a lock on the door and they probably have a pretty sophisticated alarm system and security staff. Uh, they have um, an inventory or uh, a catalog. But here, did you see where it says 360 objects in total? The Kimball Art Museum has one of the smallest object collections by number of any major museum in the world. They all, it's primarily, they've acquired a few things, but it's primarily what Kay and Velma bought and, and wheeled to the foundation. And they said, no, we're not gonna increase it we're gonna nurture it very slowly and we're gonna make sure everything is a masterpiece. So the mission, the inventory and, and, and their total inventory can fit on two pieces of paper with 360 objects. And you can believe that they have a professional conservation staff and they handle and treat these things very, very well and their environment very tightly controlled and so on. So, you know, if you have the resources, you can enforce your personal vision for your collection into it, project it into an institution, and it can be just what you wanted it to be. However, let's talk about another collection. It's a little bit different. This too was started by a very wealthy person. His name was Nelson Blunt, and he was in the seafood uh, business in New England. In fact, his family's business supplied all of the clams for decades of Campbell's clam soup, any soup of Campbell's that had a clam content, they bought them from Nelson Blunt's company. Nelson Blunt loved trains and collected trains, not model trains, full-size trains. And he envisioned a museum for his collection that would house his locomotives and his, all of his stuff um, in, in a way that made it readily available to the public, the public could share his love of railroading. Well, unfortunately, he was a private private pilot and he died in, in a plane crash before really very young, I think he was only 49 when he died. And he didn't fully realize his dream, but he did leave a considerable heritage and fortune into his collection. 
after a lot of ups and downs where things were not very well cared for, ultimately his collection was merged with a number of others to create what became known recently as Steamtown National Historic Site. Steamtown is located near Scranton, Pennsylvania, and it has, uh, you can see from the aerial view that it has, uh, it was built oh, uh, around uh, locomotive repair yards for uh, a railroad, I forget which one. So it seemed like a natural place to house his collection and then the Park Service, the National Historic Site is part of the National Park Service. Uh, people don't realize that the National Park Service maintains hundreds of museums, many of which are quite sizable. Few of them are as big as Steamtown, but um, one thing you also got to know about National Park Service is they're kind of starved for resources. So after, in the 1970s, this huge collection from him, the founder, and many other individuals was brought together to create Steamtown. And Steamtown has a bit of an inventory problem. And in fact, they're struggling to do the, the fundamentals. I, I'm sorry to say, roof overhead, yeah, they got it, but the, the visitor center and the, and the technology uh, exhibitions have been closed because the environmental system is broken. They can't heat or cool it. And they struggle to maintain these specialized repair buildings. And so roof overhead, yeah, but they're struggling. Uh, lock on the door, I don't know much about that, but I assume they have security. Inventory, and here's where you begin to see the opposite side of the coin about objects. So the Kimball with 360 objects, Steamtown, 4,617,261 objects in the last estimated count because they're drowning in stuff and they just can't, they, they can't possibly cope with it all. And, and they don't have the resources to do it or the staff to do it or any of those things. So it, it's an institution which does great work, saves important stuff, but is, is struggling and it's because their mission is very broad. Their slice of American industrial heritage is very wide. Uh, railroading is huge, uh, big and small, and uh, it, it's a it's a difficulty. So if you're steam if you're steam town, if you're steam town, you've got some work to do. I'm just going to end up now. Um, so with those two examples in mind, I'm going to ask you you all to think about the question of. Can radio collections have a future? What would their future be? First of all, it's built on the passion and resources of, of private collectors. And every, every private collection has to be preserved on some level by its creator. And then it has to find new purpose and new value in some kind of setting. So the heart and soul of preservation is caring, loving your collection, knowing how to care for it, know the know the uh, sort of the technical realities, plan for its future and make that plan concrete and share it with your loved ones or share it with the institution you have in mind and, and go from there. So I thank you all for your attention. Uh, those of you who don't know the Antique Wireless Museum, it's located on Route 5 in Bloomfield, New York. And uh, if you haven't already joined the Antique Wireless Association and visit the museum. So thank you very much. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.